uh, to see so many people here for an in-person conference uh, to learn and to celebrate about all the education research that happens at McMaster. Um, we're going to give out a couple of awards now, and then we have our panelists sitting in the front row who will come up and, uh, and have our closing panel. So the first award is uh, the Education Scholarship Fund. So this is a, a fund that has been awarded over the last few years to support and promote scholarship, whether that's research or innovation, in health sciences education within the Faculty of Health Sciences at McMaster. Um, we have two recipients this year, so I'm, I'm not sure if either of them are here at the moment, but if you are, perhaps you could stand up and give a little wave to folks. Uh, so our first winner is Dr. Patricia Perugia of the Department of Surgery with her proposal for an innovative undergraduate elective curriculum in Indigenous Health Needs Assessment. I don't think that was <laughs> Our second winner is uh, Dr. Matthew Sybil for his proposal Developing an Identity as a Health Professional in the Era of Hashtag Self-Obsessed and Hashtag All About Me. Insights on Social and Transformational Learning. Okay. I was debating whether it would be a funny joke or not to say pound sign. Um, and then I also have the, uh, the distinct honor of presenting our Health Professions and Educator Award. So this is an award which uh, goes to a, a senior faculty member within the Faculty of Health Sciences here at McMaster who has made a sustained contribution to health professional education, both locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, it could, these, these contributions could include innovation in the classroom or clinical setting, graduate supervision, mentorship, or education scholarship. And our list of, uh, of past winners really is sort of a who's who of, of shaping education at McMaster. Uh, we have Drs. Sue Baptiste, Rob White, Daniel Landine, Sarah Wojcikowski, and Nadine Ganji, who are HSEB students, had the pleasure of meeting yesterday afternoon at the, at the Welcome Recession. This year, I'm really honored to present uh, the award to my colleague in the Department of Family Medicine, Dr. Elizabeth Shaw. Uh, Dr. Shaw is uh, just a couple of weeks away from retirement, so I know that we are all very uh, happy for her and all of the big pursuits that she will be pursuing, but also really sad to see her go and to lose the wisdom and the insight and the energy for educational uh, improvement that comes uh, that comes from her both from within our department, but also really all of the contributions that she has made in shaping primary care education across Canada. So Dr. Shaw is a professor of family medicine. She's uh, currently the associate chair of education and is a past program director. When she was program director of family medicine, she more than doubled the size of the program, uh, creating a whole bunch of new community sites to increase our ability to train family physicians. And of course, with that came the need for more preceptors. And she really was instrumental in supporting the growth of the department to 27 full-time and over 900 part-time faculty members in the Department of Family Medicine. And I, I think that anybody who's involved in, in faculty or professional development knows that you can't just take somebody and throw them into the learner and expect good feedback and, and coaching and, and learning to happen, that there is a lot of faculty development and, uh, that is required. And, and Dr. Shaw was really instrumental in, in doing that to grow the program. Clinically, she does some general family medicine with homeless and inner city populations through the Shelter Health Network. She has a certificate of added competence in addiction medicine and provides care for patients with substance use disorders. She also provides prenatal and addiction care to women struggling with substance use through the maternity center of cancer. Educationally, uh, Dr. Shaw has really, really uh, influenced and, and shaped primary care education in Canada through her role in developing the triple C competency-based curriculum. So uh, family docs, we like to say we have competency-based education first. You know, there's a lot of talk and a lot of excitement about it now, but family medicine, I, I don't know if I'm And Dr. Shaw was really important in, in that innovation. Uh, Dr. Shaw has also uh, participated in the development of CanMeds FM and the revisions of CanMeds FM in 2017. Additionally, because, you know, if, if this isn't enough though, in terms of contributions to education, uh, she's the Director of Module Development for the Foundation for Medical Practice Education, and she assists with the editing and production of, of educational modules for this group, over 40 so far. 
Uh, and these are used by 5,000 family physicians and, and family medicine residents across the, the country in these multiple learning sessions. Dr. Cha was the 2020 recipient of the College of Family Physicians of Canada Ian McWinney Medical Education Award, which is a really big deal, and also a 2019 recipient of the Canadian Association of Medical Education Certificate of Merit. So we are not the only ones to recognize her contributions in this space. Dr. Cha, I'd like to invite you up to, uh, to say a few words and say something more. Thank you so much, Meredith. You actually stole my thunder around retirement. That was going to be part of my work for you. But anyway, I mean, it is absolutely such an honor to be recognized within a faculty that is home to so many exemplary educators and educational scholars. Thank you so much to Merritt for supporting this award. And certainly thank you to my colleagues in the Department of Family Medicine for nominating. As Meredith mentioned, um, this award is particularly meaningful given my impending retirement from McMaster, and uh, it is impending, it's only three weeks away. So I think a, a few words are appropriate, um, but I guarantee you it's only a few words. In keeping with my generalist view on the world as a family physician, I think it would also be appropriate to say that my career in education has been somewhat eclectic. However, of all of the roles, all of the educational roles that I have had an opportunity to take on, I think one of the most personally meaningful, and I might argue one of the most important, is that of mentor. I have been so proud to see the, many of the residents and the junior faculty that I have mentored go on to surpass me in terms of their clinical, educational, and scholarly endeavors. As an educational leader, I believe this is our legacy, to contribute to an ongoing community of excellence and the next generation of educators. I have been blessed in my own career to have outstanding mentors. As I step down from this very fulfilling career, it is my only hope that I have been able to give back in some of the same way. Thank you once again for honoring me with this award. The next event on our program is our closing panel, so I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sandra Montero up. She is the moderator of this panel and, and will introduce it. Dr. Montero is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and an education scientist with Merit. She also has a second appointment to the Center of Simulation-Based Learning as the Director of Scholarship. Dr. Montero received her PhD in Psychology from McMaster University in 2013 and currently manages a successful international collaboration investigating theoretical models of cognitive processes behind clinical reasoning with applications for education and assessment. In 2020, she received the Excellence in Graduate Student Supervision Award from the Faculty of Health Sciences, and in 2021, she received the Meredith Marks New Educator Award. Dr. Montero. And thank you all for participating in such an awesome day. Year 2022 is almost an end, but not quite. We've got a special treat, as Meredith explained. Um, and I just want to acknowledge something just for a moment, because I feel like sometimes with really new peers out there, it takes a while. Way. There's something very severe about having a podium and slides to speak to, and very unnerving about just sitting on a chair facing all of you. So I just want to say that in case that helps the speakers as they are called up here to join us. Uh, but it's my absolute pleasure to start to introduce our esteemed panel of assessment experts who've been um, invited to share their knowledge. And I wanted to take a cue from Andrea um, this morning, who tried to share with us the journey of how her research came about and sort of her origin story, if you will. So I dug a little bit, um, so sorry, I'm gonna have to be reading here a little bit, but I took some notes to think of what my versions of the origin stories are. There's, um, don't worry, there's no baby pictures. I'm not, I'm not trying to embarrass anyone, but um, when I first met um, Andrea at a conference, she was presenting findings from her PhD titled Questioning the Radar Idiosyncrasy Explanation for Error Variance by Searching for Multiple Signals Within the Noise. And her voice to me was rather revolutionary in the field of assessment where the idiosyncrasies of radars were interpreted as limitations to be eliminated or anything. And she brought a new perspective encouraging us to value these variations. 
um, getting her start as a practitioner of naturopathic medicine, although she also explained her roles as a coach and, and multiple other forms of um, teaching that she took on. She's now assistant professor for the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Northern British Columbia. And with her fascination of how people think, Dr. Ingrid has pursued research into the variability of test assessment judgments. And her work has prompted multiple bodies of related research, including approaches to clinical supervision and ethical decision making in rural clinical boxes. That's Andrea to Andrea to the Personally, I know we're supposed to come up with one, but there's two that spoke to me 
Um, so the first one was, um, how can we be sure that our assessment is actually resulting in meaningful learning rather than just being a tick box exercise? So when we think about the um, goal of many assessments, it's assessment for learning. Um, of course, sometimes we want to do assessment of learning, but we often want to do it for learning. Uh, again, in reality, that doesn't always happen. Uh, learners and faculty might see it as a barrier, something that they have to do, um, something that takes extra time. And so one of the big questions for me is how do we actually make sure that our assessment practices are facilitating learning? And the other one that um, I came up with that I think is, is just partially because I'm interested in from a research perspective is how do we ensure equitable uh, assessment? And I think it's increasingly becoming obvious that not all learners have the same assessment experiences. Uh, different people have uh, access to very different types of assessment, and there's some emerging literature, um, for example, on gender and how that impacts assessment. But there's so much more to be understood about, um, you know, the experiences of different equity-deserving groups, um, what the role of the, the rater is in that. And so for me, that's another big question. And I think a big gap is um, understanding also how to address this question. So when we do uncover inequities, uh, what do we do about them? What are best practices? So those are two big challenges for me that, um, that I'm very interested in. Thank you. First, I just want to say how great it is to be back here. As Sandra was mentioning, I uh, am an alumni here. I went to school here for master's and PhD. It was, uh, it was a great treat to be here, so I'm happy to be back. Um, and I was very, very nervous about what Sandra was going to say about it. <laughs> because when, when people ask my wife about the work I do, you kind of just shrug. So Sandra got it right. So, so one of the things she did talk about was uh, philosophical positions and assessment. So for me, one of the topic areas that I'm wrestling with, playing with, is again thinking about these philosophical positions. And I don't mean big P philosophy, like all these different isms that you can attach to it. Not, not even that, just the assumptions and commitments that we hold as a part of the assessment process and being explicit about them. So once upon a time, I would say assessments could be viewed very consistently uh, in how we approach it and how we think about it. Measurement theory, positive, these kinds of things were very, very consistent. And what's happened over time, thanks to some of the work that these two have been doing and others, is getting us to think a little bit differently about approaches, methods, ways of doing things, ways of collecting data, ways of analyzing data. And what that's meant is a whole mix of methods and ideas without always a clear articulation of what they mean. So those underlying, and then when you have these underlying, what that means is that we will use the same words but mean different things. So let me just give you a, a very quick example. Or we will interpret assessment different, assessment quality different. That's really problematic for our assessment. So let me give you a quick example. Uh, there's a study by Sydney Smeen, her colleagues, uh, friends of ours, certainly, and some of the work with uh, uh, up here. And they did a really great study about graders and picking graders for this work that I talked earlier this morning. They did this really great talk, or sorry, this really great paper about combining a standardized patients and um, physician ratings of, of performance. And what they were looking for was agreement. So imagine two different readers of that paper. Reader number one believes that that agreement is really great. And so if we get two different people, even from two different contexts, to agree on something, then we're in a good place. Quality is there, assessment is strong. And imagine a second reader who views it entirely differently, and says, no, it's not agreement that we want. We actually want more diversity. We want, we want those two people to give us all kinds of information, and then we'll put that together. That's good assessment. So from the exact same paper, you have an author who intends something, and then readers who could see it very differently. And, and so that's because they hold, those two readers hold very different assumptions and commitments about what is good assessment and what it should be. And this spans all of assessment. What is confidence? What are our assessment features? What is validity? What are the qualities of it? And so on. So you can span it. So I've been looking at that to think about whether it matters. One argument could be maybe that doesn't matter, that we pay attention to those things. And secondly, when it does matter, what do we do about it? So that's one of the most, that's the one that I'm paying attention to the most at this point, because it feels very messy at this point for me. Uh, and I'm trying to make sense of it. The second is competition assessment. 
the competition and assessment, and this comes from my role in PGME at UT, is our assessment, particularly in the CDME context, our assessment is in competition with lots of other things, accreditation, compliance, technology, faculty development, all of these different things eat up space, take up space and time, and have influence over the kinds of assessments that we create. If assessment scientists, anybody here or those of you up there who are doing this work, um, were to only work in a vacuum, only think about assessment and how to optimize that well, it would look sometimes different than when we have to comply with accreditation requirements. When we have to comply with the technology that only allows a certain amount of uh, characters or text. All of these things are competing. Similarly with validity, we're seeing uh, uh, a diminishing of validity because of this competition. Anyway, so those are the two things. Competing in context and assessment, and those all the positions. Oh, sorry. I felt like I was yelling. Yeah. <laughs> I have no rush to point because you weren't yelling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Space histories of her. Uh, I guess uh, for, for my next problem that I'm grappling with, psychometrics has just been so powerful for assessment as a metaphor of measurement uh, with its ability to filter through massive amounts of data and help us make very important decisions. Uh, and it continues to be. And I, the next thing is, what do we use for the stuff that doesn't work with psychometric, what's that next metaphor theory that can handle words, that can handle the subjective uh, impressions, that can handle all of those other things that aren't captured well there? I don't think we quite have that yet, certainly not in the same sort of um, useful, powerful, can handle a lot of information. Uh, we have some metaphors of pixels and mosaics, of um, spider plots and learning trajectories. And, uh, and a few things, but just not that, I don't think we quite have that thing, and we need that thing that can not just help us visualize how we bring all this together, but then also just sort through it in an efficient uh, way that is trustworthy and that we can use to make our very high stakes decisions. If anyone has any kind of question or comment related to what our experts have now shared in regards to the importance of looking, examining equity within the assessments we design and, and the way that we're able to address what the needs of the examinees, looking at the philosophical underpinnings and the context within which we assess, and maybe rethinking our use of psychometrics alone, perhaps as a gold standard for evaluating the quality of assessments. Okay. And make sure you're on. Okay. Um, so maybe we can push this discussion a bit further in terms of like really leaning into the problems of assessment, I suppose, um, or next big challenges with the move towards competency-based education in medicine. Um, unprecedented attention has been given to assessment. Uh, what are some of the challenges in CDME specifically, and what might be one thing you would like the clinicians and clinician educators in the audience to take away today? Okay, there's a lot in that. Yes, CBME and assessment. CBME assessment, the challenges. So in the move to the CBME, I see this for a lot of pressure on assessment, and particularly on raters <laughs> to provide uh, information. Uh, so to me, I think that there's a need for us to pay attention to our assessment of learning. There has also been a big push to emphasize our assessment for learning, but what I see in some attempts to implement some of the concepts is that we're ending up in a place of assessment as a bureaucracy, where it's more of collecting information, say we collected it and then people were there and uh, to compile and, and defeat it. And I think that's what we need to be careful of, of how to do this well, with high quality information that we can use in ways to make important decisions. Uh, there was a, a clinical educators, a, a takeaway. Um, I think my biggest one that, that I'm starting to see at a different uh, projects that I'm involved with is to that when asked to do ad hoc assessments to try to find some that are representative of the training. Uh, 
uh, that the, some of the random ones that are selected for various reasons may not be as useful and that this could be a way that we can get some of those in that are very representative thinking of clinical tests. There are lots of tests that are quite useful. Lactate is useful. Doing a whole bunch of lactates over time is not useful. And so I would hate for ad hoc uh, assessments to be more like those, those um, lab tests that aren't giving us a lot of information, instead pick something that happened in the day that you think really speaks to where that training is at right now, to either give feedback to them or to give assessment data to the program on how that training is doing. Uh, a lot, yeah, that's great. I want to pick up on something that Andrew just said, though, the um, of and for, and I think he also talked about, and say something that might be uh, controversial, and maybe the thought that it makes some of you to disagree. Uh, is that we should separate entirely the formative assessment from the summative assessment. Completely. Yeah, I don't know if people agree with that. This looks like John. <laughs> um, I, you know, the CPME thing has just absolutely blurred those lines. And, and I know what the response has been. The response has been, uh, well, we're lowering the stakes and that should help. And that might be true. The stakes have been lowered by increasing the number of observations and the number of assessments and those sorts of things. However, learners and graders still see both those opportunities, regardless of what you call them, as summative opportunities, as summative interactions. And so as a result, behaviors in both the graders and the learners change. If we focus on just the learners for a second, which both Andrea and Rita brought up, it changes their behavior. It changes what they do. It changes their learning opportunities. They don't reveal gaps. They hide them. And the analogy that comes to, comes to mind is my son is uh, in Jiu Jitsu, he's nine years old, he's in Jiu Jitsu, and he's preparing for competition and tournaments. And when he goes to prepare, he goes during the week to prepare. Um, he says to me at one point that you know, we're talking about experiment and trying different things, even if they don't work. And he says to me, well, I, you know, I can't do that, then they'll get my back, which would be he failed, essentially. He's talking about failing as a result of a particular experiment that he and we talked about the value, we talked about the distinction between being in that academy during on a Wednesday uh, and experiment, trying and revealing to your coach and to your colleagues how much you're you know limited in a particular skill or a particular area. But then when you go to the tournament, that's not the time to mess around. That's the time to perform. And we very much try to separate that. And in CBME, I think we just completely blurred that and we're seeing. The implications of that, I think more and more people see the problem with that. And so that's the big thing that we have to try to find a way to solve to get around uh, in this next year. Yeah, that's a fantastic suggestion. And I was thinking along those same lines because when I was studying confidence committees, it became clear that the stuff that they were looking for and valuing in an assessment was not necessarily the same thing that learners were looking for and valuing. And the amount of time that you know, is required to provide the kind of information they need is challenging. Um, so I agree, separating those two things out uh, sounds like a really good idea. Um, some of the challenges I had sort of listed were definitely the workload, the fatigue, and I think coming off of COVID and uh, increased challenges that people have been facing clinically, the introduction of CBME has been challenging because it's adding another change on top of that. And I think also putting the onus on the learner can be challenging um, because obviously for, for many learners, they're, they're quite motivated and they're able to sustain, you know, encouraging people to complete assessments. But there's always, you know, challenges with doing that because it is supposed to be more of a partnership and putting the onus completely on the learner I think can be quite challenging. Um, and that's something I've heard from a lot of people. Um, but I do agree that that separation is something that I think would be really important. Um, and it's hard to perceive something as for learning when you know that it's going to be seen by program officials and things like that. So um, separating those feedback conversations out, I think, is a good, is a good practical strategy. Thank you. Um, something of a theme that I kind of saw connecting all three of your responses was almost like a shared mental model. So I'm happy that I could see uh, with Andrea, with your answer, you know, encouraging clinicians to really think of what's representative of that person that you're assessing. In some ways, in doing so, reflecting on what your goal is, right? So whether it's formative or summative, um, and um, 
made some state primacy, as I just forgot what you said. Um, <laughs> but it's in there. Uh, but I think if we um, consider how we can create that shared mental model with a resident or trainees approaching your supervisor to ask for that assessment, do they both have the same thing in mind, right, in terms of what's going to be the outcomes of this? Um, and so even if it's supposed to be permanent, the trainee might be just under a lot of stress because they feel like they're, uh, any discompetencies or inabilities are just going to shine really, really bright, and that's going to be what they're known for forever. But the faculty member might be like, no, this is a learning experience. Um, that does definitely change what's going to happen. Um, and so I'm curious uh, if any of you thought about the, the value of having assessors only sort of wandering around. Someone mentioned the idea of the role of a scribe. So in a clinical setting, you, know, you might have someone who's hired to be there full time just taking notes and, and making sure that the documentation is accurate. Uh, and some people proposed creating an independent role of an assessor who's not there um, as a teacher or a patient protector, but really just focusing on assessment of the woman. React to that. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Um, I'm not sure that person would be very well liked, but uh, I don't know. There's Walter coming back. <laughs> I think what, one of the nice things about assessment, that, I mean, that I when I think of some of the experiences I've had is when it can be authentic and you feel like you're really getting something out of it that the person's invested in your learning and it's based on you know your what you feel is your actual performance rather than. Um, you know, just a selected opportunity that feels really prescribed. So that may be challenging, but it is an interesting idea to separate it out. And then I suppose you could have some people that give you more feedback sort of in the moment for your learning, and then the, maybe the assessment goes for a different purpose. But um, yeah, I don't know how it would work in practicality. I, I guess I'll still have to work through that. Yeah, yeah I would say absolutely separate. So there's a there's a project that we're working on. We're doing it in the paramedic context, which I, I I get is different than a lot of other contexts. But the formal developmental assessment activities are over there. The summative activities, the performance performance orientation is over here. It's clear to everybody. It's clear to the faculty. It's clear to the learners. It's clear to the institution. It's signaled in lots of different ways. Um, we. We try to think very carefully about what we're signaling when we say or do certain things and whether or not we're breaking that hopefully culture of growth performance, or sorry, growth and formative value over here and performance over here. Now that's not easy and a lot. We're playing with that in PGME too, and it's obviously very difficult in some contexts. But that's I think where we have to go. So we need the researchers to try to think about how to do that and address the practical situation. Yeah, I, I like the idea that we do some things that we have separate that we can't do when they're combined. Uh, to take the supervisor perspective, we're asking them to do a lot when they fill out that little comment box for a workplace based assessment that's supposed to be completed um, on, on the spot or closely after. When we're asking them to think about documenting feedback that they gave to the trainee, to think about documenting in a way that they know. Um, is going to be used for some of the purposes to speak to the trainee as an audience, to speak to a competency committee or program director in a different way. It puts a lot of pressure on how do you how do you come up with the words that can convey all that well, and um, and because of that, I think sometimes we end up with a lot fewer words than what we can, and sacrifice both purposes and the information seen. Uh, with both audiences, uh, and then we start looking at how can we do that within the just the little constraints that we have. Um, whether it's blind comment boxes or specific forms that are more for one or the other, or moments or people, or, or there's different ways that we could. Um, Thank you. Just want to find out if there's water under your seat. So I guess connecting to that, uh, do you have any further thoughts on how can we use assessments to engage learners better? Have some tips to, to offer, um, and really just highlighting based on your, your research, perhaps, and, and reading through the literature, how do assessments actually discourage learners and maybe even the process of learning? 
Yeah, so I was going to talk about the mixed messages that can happen when you're kind of complaining, formative and summative. Um, other things that come along, I, I like the idea of being very open about our, our point of view and subjectivity when we're relaying information to people when it's coming from a place, um, you, know, you know, from my perspective, based on what I saw, um, those sorts of things, and acknowledging that I may not have that perfect, but yet I can still give feedback from that space. And then have a conversation around, oh, um, invite that other, the trainee's perspective into it and, and move forward that way. So I think it's like what Anita was saying before, it's relational. That anytime we ask uh, someone to assess someone else to social interaction, and, and the more that we can take that into account, that I think the more useful the information can be. Uh, for both. I agree entirely. I don't have much to add to that, other than to say the implication of that would be. That assessments be flexible and individualized as opposed to fixed and standardized. That's really difficult logistically and we haven't quite figured out how to do that. But where possible, uh, to, to achieve some of those goals that the just talked about, I think that's the individual. Figure out how to, to discuss it. Yeah, for me, the real relationality is so important because I, I recall instances where I might have assessed someone one way, but then in speaking to them and having a conversation, realizing, wow, there's there's a lot of context here that I might have missed. And whether or not you change the assessment is one thing, but it really does help with that learning conversation because you can build in, oh, I see why I did it this way. You know, there are some things you can change. It's, it's, much, it's a much better experience when you're able to have that partnership. And I think the training feels, you know, more... Like you're an open educator, someone that they can talk to, someone that they can share with everyone. So I do find that really helpful. And the other one I would add quickly is doing it in the moment. So trying to keep it as close to the performance as possible so that you don't forget details. It's like, you know, if a student asks you to write a reference letter and it's months or years later, it's a lot harder to do than if it's in the moment. And I think it's the same for, for sort of like the clinical experiences. You want to do it as close to the time as possible. Yeah, and I think that's the, the word human, humanness that I was referencing or, um, in your keynote this morning, I think that's also coming to mind. Now, not to suggest that clinicians forget that their trainees are humans, but I think when there's just a task or a checklist that's in front of you and some boxes to tick off or someone's handed you a phone and said, just complete this uh, PPA assessment for me, there may be a moment of like that disconnect um, and so we have to find ways to bring that, that human part of it back in. Um, okay, so now bringing a little bit of culture <laughs> into this discussion. So the lead in, um, Tolstoy once wrote, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. I don't know if any of you agree with that, but that certainly has a lot of assumptions and implications. Um, so reflecting on your research programs, um, take the rate of contribution to assessment very uh, sorry, um, no, let me start that again. Your research programs take the rate of contribution to assessment very seriously. Um, can we sort of integrate this perspective that Tolstoy offered and maybe create an analogy for raters? Are strong raters all alike? Uh, weak readers, uh, weak in their own way. So I don't think so. I think that uh, maybe we focus more on the weak readers because you know they're problematic to <laughs> from a you know practical perspective, and we try to figure out okay what's going on, how do we make it better. But often the strong performers sort of get neglected. I think if you were to actually study and look at how strong readers operate, there's probably a lot of different ways that they can you know that they do that. Just like there's many different ways that one can be a good teacher, a good educator, a lot of different styles. Um, we might learn a lot from breaking down how we consider strong readers, you know, do their work. Um, I don't think we've done a ton of that, but it would be very interesting. Um, and I think we would find that they, they might have different styles, um, and there's many different ways to be a good assessor, or at least several different ways to be a good assessor. So that's my take on it. And for me, I don't even know how I would define strong and weak readers. That's where I would struggle first. I think I would be like, oh, okay. I know how I would define it earlier, before Andrea's work. And so am I. Earlier would be, Somebody demonstrating the middleware, for example, but not differentiating between people or between items or whatever it is. That's how I would define it before, 
But now I don't know. Now I'm not so sure that I would use that definition. Uh, and so, and, and based on what we've been talking about, and I wish we could disagree with that. <laughs> I feel like we should fight about something, but um, but based on what we've been talking about, to do that. But based, based on what we've been talking about, a matter of you know, separating form and summative and so on, um, the writer takes a different role. The person, the observer, the faculty, whatever, takes a different role. So so learning and teaching and all those other things come into play in terms of what's weak and what's strong. Uh, and certainly not uh, not just what they put down on the paper or what they say or don't say. Or, or to the benefit of colleagues, colleagues, or whatever. So I think it, it, to me it comes down to not that we have to agree, but how do we get to a place of saying, here's what we mean by good and bad, strong and weak, uh, beneficial, not beneficial, supportive, not supportive, and coming up with those definitions in our technology. I would also say no, that they are not all the same. Um, and I spent a lot of time looking for things that were the same between <laughs> um, participants in my studies to try to find some kind of consistency that would help with a pattern or, or help make sense of the uh, difference in ratings. Um, Hawk Dove didn't really explain it. There were a few people that were always towards the highest of the ratings, a few people that were always towards the lowest, but not as many as you would think to be able to say this is a, some people are too stringent, some people are too lenient and we just need to help them come into a better balance. Um, we found that, the, that often the, the different points of view were based on emphasizing either kind of like rapport building and those relational things uh, that they were assessing compared to more technical skills or, or medical expertise. But it wasn't the same people who were like, they were the good rapport assessing people and always prioritize that across the different encounters. It was different people doing that. Um, I look for any kind of consistency <laughs> um, to explain what was, it wasn't if they were new uh, to the to it, it, or if they had extra training, or um, where they're located, there's all those kinds of things. So didn't find it in, in the bit of data that, that I had, and frankly, I was wishing I could find something to be able to say that was a finding that would be easy to build. Um, yeah, I'm not going to disagree with any of you other, and I just wanted to share some comments here. Like, it's interesting, um, you know, Walter, uh, Anita, himself, sort of having this McMaster background. Um, McMaster has this reputation of helping uh, establish evidence-based medicine. There's a lot of powerhouse uh, researchers here with a very quantitative uh, and certainly strong psychometric background, and I think it's I feel like, uh, at least with us, we've evolved towards, um, you know, Walter, with your new research program, looking at philosophical underpinnings of, of greater assessment, I feel like that would have been really, really odd in your conversations with, with Jeff uh, <laughs> when you were doing your PhD. Yes. Um, I'm not sure how that would have gone. Uh, but I do think it reflects um, really what, what Andrea has been bringing with her research. That, those idiosyncrasies, those, those very obvious, those different perspectives are important, and psychometrics just doesn't help us really evaluate that and, and do justice to describe what's, what's valuable and what's true. And that's even a work we can use. Um, any resistance from the audience at this point? We're looking for some conflict. Jeff's hand is. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, before you say something, though, I, I, I want to reflect on a conversation you and I had, given that this isn't contributed to Jeff and I. There was a conversation, so when that paper was coming out, before it was actually published in Advances in Health Sciences, um, Jeff and I had a conversation about that at the Wilson Center Research Day. I don't know if you remember this. We went out, we went out to uh, a little uh, a solarium and sat there and talked about it. And then at that time, there was a lot of push for you know, this argument that uh, all this noise is suddenly signal. And there was a big version to that, like to, to, to believe that suddenly everything that was once noise is now signal is just ridiculous. Um, and so we got into this, into this real great conversation where we were just trying to, you know, reflecting on the way the assessment community was moving. And uh, I was, uh, I think there was an assumption at that point that, you know, perhaps I was advocating for a position like that. And what Jeff helped me see is that. Actually, it's raising this particular topic to give people an opportunity to talk about it, to contribute to it, to participate in the conversation. And at one point, we heard him say, uh, maybe this isn't important. 
Maybe it's not relevant. Maybe we don't need to pay attention to these things. But we definitely need to talk about it. And it was that uh, conversation that Jeff had with me at that point to you know, push this forward a little bit. So I want to share that based off the fact that we're there. Now you can answer your question. <laughs> Yeah, I used to be clever. <laughs> um, one thing that's like a metric, I think, is remind us of is that it, it has a term in the equation called random error. Of course, random error is designed to use just a variation that is not going to be but the quality of it and may not be explained. The other phenomenon that we all know well, and it's one more city is labeled as the single biggest. Finding or discovery in all of medical education for the last billion years is content specificity. Regardless of how much you constrain things, so that it's a dumb study for you, is at the same case, the same resident, it's two weeks apart. And all the measures are objective. The only difference is that the one standard patient has red hair and the other has brown hair. The correlation of all the hair is typically 0.1 to 0.2 in all three years. It may just be a huge stress to try and identify those the sources of those errors. I hope, I hope I'm wrong, but this is so far from my side of this. And what that suggests is that maybe that the solution is not to try and identify the sources of errors, but to try to minimize them by adding to by and by end. I don't know if it's going to be a system of all else errors and pieces of synthesis. It applies to all the nations as well as people. Maybe getting off of the job, I think you're right about it, because we want to do perhaps separate some of the performance. Put our records into some of the assessment that is efficient in terms of information for units. And that may mean that we sacrifice authenticity because the human medicine has shown that authenticity doesn't buy very much anymore. Who has three or four hour cases of the least new patient has been out? We don't have enough time and we never have enough cases. I really made the question of essentially using some of the evaluation to do what some of the evaluation can do well, maximize the information from them. Not trying to delude ourselves and think this should be a good permanent. For some of you, more and more than the patient, it's less and less of time to worry about being nice with that better. I think I'll try to do that. I would do that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, of course, so having Jeff on memories. I feel like now I should get behind the chair. Um, so, I mean, I agree with a lot of what you said there, um, the, especially the part about separating the formative and summative. I'll just use, for argument's sake, the word error, and you heard Andrea talk about this as well. Too, uh, is not in the vernacular for some people in assessment. For some people in assessment. Not in this case, <laughs> but for some people in assessment. And that's not to say that one is right and the other one is wrong. It's just to say that it exists. And so because it exists, that's where the conversation has to happen. And so we have to talk about that. So let's talk about you know, the fact that you're not using the concept of error, but I am. And what does that mean for when we go to make determinations about what is quality assessment? Quality assessment might be exactly the way Jeff just, Jeff just described it. Increase the reliability of the process by increasing the sample of observations, the number of observers, and so on. Uh, and that might be one way to do it. Uh, but some people would say reliability is not king or queen. It is, it is not relevant. That's not what Jeff would say. That's probably not what I would say. <laughs> but the point is, there are people who say that reliability is not what matters. And so we have that in our assessment community. That might be some of you too. And so because we have that, we have to have a conversation about what that means. What does that mean for the learner? What does that mean for the faculty? What does that mean for the institution? What does that mean for us as readers and users of the, of the literature that's being contributed? All of that. And so, the only principle we put out so far about this topic is to say, actually I'll just make two points, two last points. The only principle we put out is to say, there must be some degree of compatibility between how you think about competence, the assessment strategies you choose, and the validity arguments you make. There just has to be compatibility among those three. That's not to say that it has to be this isn't or that isn't. It just has to be compatibility. 
Um, and the second is to trace the changes that have happened over time. So there's a paper that I did with a uh, uh, by the name of Jacob Pierce from uh, Australia, who we traced the shifts in uh, thinking about programmatic assessment from, I think it was from 1995 to today, and how the philosophical positions have changed in that thinking over time. That made it real. And so now we have to talk about it. So that, that's all I'm saying here when I talk about philosophical positions. Any contradictions? Or? Yeah, I'm just going to well, add on to well, we could talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wanted to, to share a bit, like something that came to mind as we were talking about that is, um, you know, I think it's very clear to imagine assessing a skill procedure or something a little bit more concrete, arguably, and so increases the sample size makes perfect sense. Arguably, something like unprofessionalism, which is a red flag, you want to be able to detect reliability may make no sense because. The one moment of an inappropriate behavior or action might be enough cause for concern. Um, and my my concern is that those moments happen individually, sort of separate from each other, and then there's multiple there, maybe there is reliability, it's just people don't necessarily share that. Um, or maybe there's value in having that one person um, share their concern and then and then have it looked into to uncover the rare um, that. And maybe I'll put on a program director of that. Just a second, that idea. But you struggle with the fact of the patient care of the Louisa. Nothing really ends up being truly formative. If a signal emerges and there's a concern raised, then sometimes the trainee may discuss that with the supervisor and have insight, and two of them are satisfied. But if they're not, then it gets documented for some way or another, either through an official assessment process or not. And it becomes some of it because then the program director will be involved. And measurements are no, no way to get uh, And as a program director, I feel that we own all of the uses, uh, regardless of their reliability, because that one event will be large. And so, program we either have to sweep it under the carpet or we need tackle it. And I think that feels some of it from a resident perspective because tackling it means putting up a stop sign. Uh, so, I, I don't know if there really is anything that doesn't have some sub of it when they're in the workplace. And I know that might stand in contrast to all of your perspective. I think that's true for most things in life that we're never going to have a zero stakes, completely formative space for our trainees because that just doesn't exist. Someone um, who I might have a casual um, cocktail drink with at a conference, I may be asking them to be my external referee on the tech package um, 10 years from then and not realize that that's going to be my only interaction with that person that becomes a high stakes. <laughs> interaction I'm looking back and I and I think this is our trainees know that at any point in time that could be the person who's interviewing you later on or your future colleague or so yes there are always stakes I, when I talk about separating I mean we're having a space where if you're allowed to be more vulnerable with someone who recognizes that you're learning and there are, there are things that you are having um, difficulty with because we all have things that we have a little bit more difficulty with and they will help support you to get better because they're there to help you to get better. And then that's different from um, saying if you're doing it well enough. So it's about improving no matter where you're at on those things compared to saying, uh, is this good enough or not for you to progress? But to know that even in those other experiences, uh, every time you're working with anyone, uh, it, it could be someone who's going to be a decision maker in your life uh, at some at some given point. Any issues? Uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, I'm trying to see if anyone can share or scan. Okay. So the last question I have prepared, and in some ways it gives our panel the last word um, for the official schedule of the day. Um, and actually, yeah, we start with the media, and that would be um, really great. We can round up and get a keynote speaker.
Um, so to close, I'd like each of you to leave us with um, your provocative suggestion for the future assessment. Um, something that you'd be willing to defend, but really it's the end of the day and then you get to leave. So I think <laughs> um, what, what you want to put out there. Something, so an idea that maybe that's been stewing in your mind, even um, all of your, your research and experience in this field. Um, and um, yeah. Yeah, I think what I've been thinking about as I was preparing for this panel is, and it sort of goes well with where we ended up, is how we focused so much on formalization and documentation of experience that we've lost out on the actual learning part. And so I think what you were saying about the separation um, is, you know, is very much linked to that because it allows for that learning opportunity and then it allows for the assessment to be separate from that. Um, the other piece that we haven't talked about, um, oh sorry, that we haven't talked about but that I thought uh, was interesting to mention was just the role of technology as a tool. I just don't think we've done a very good job, you know, incorporating technology um, at, to the best of its um, potential. I know there's been some really good efforts, but I think there's a lot more that we can do with it. Um, and just some of my work on common cities has revealed how much of a barrier it can be in some cases. Um, yet I think there's immense potential not to not to necessarily take over, but to be used as a as a helpful tool. So that's just one thing I wanted to say at some point. Are you gonna talk about the train? No. Not right now. <laughs> uh, I'll say just a couple. Um, one is uh, that might be a bit provocative. We talked a little bit about this already. Maybe not. Is uh, designated, dedicated, uh, workplace-based summative assessment processes, uh, which may change what it means to have point-in-time summative high-stakes licensing exams, for example. Do that in the workplace as well. Uh, number two is rate of training. I heard Andrea. Respond to Jonathan's question earlier uh, today about greater training. Greater training has to be completely reimagined, and I'm working on something related to that now about rethinking that entirely. Uh, so that would be the second. Uh, and then the third is uh, so thinking about what's generated. And by that, again, I want to reflect on a conversation I had with a PhD student mine at the moment, Helen. We we think about what the assessment process. If you think about when I say generative, I mean the CDE came in. It was generative in um, establishing or, or I guess stimulating a bunch of assessment. Work. It was generative in that sense. And I heard Sandra say this actually at a, at a conference once uh, about how much activity there is uh, going on in assessment. CDE was generative. So now when we think about generative or assessment specifically. Let's think about what is being generated. How is it gener generated for other things? What is it signaling? The things that we're doing or saying and creating and building, what is it saying? And what Helen's making me think about is what do we do in, say, post grad or in formal education that is generative for future assessment contexts like CPD, for example? What is it what do we build over time about assessment, believe about assessment, feel about assessment? That then gets carried over past those formal education years uh, that maybe might be problematic. So I just use it as an example, but the point is think about what is generated, what is being generated by the assessment activities that you're just in terms of building your study. This is what someone I was planning to say, but um, <laughs> here we go. Um, since Jeff got me thinking about sampling. As, as a solution, and, and it often is, in, in a lot of cases, getting more information from more people and in more context can be very useful. When it is not useful is when we're all biased in the same way, and then averaging it, we're going to end up in the same direction. So I think we need to be careful in places where um, assessment can be othering, and we're looking at it as, are you one of us, and then using it as a, you don't seem like one of us, uh, and, and assessing that way. In those situations, it's probably going to be the outlier voice that calls us out on it. It's not going to be the average rating. It's not going to be the group consensus. It's going to be a well-reasoned, brave voice that speaks up and says, okay, I have a different point of view on this, um, and I'd like you to hear it, and I hope we have some processes in place that are able to listen to that voice even though it's not the majority voice. Yeah, 
um, as said if I may, uh, to some of that, um, just acknowledge right now, like I'm, I feel kind of odd talking about assessment and raters when that's the clinicians that are out there that are currently burnt out and, you know, facing little, or dealing with rather little crises here and there in terms of resources and staffing. And, and often it's the same for people that do really good assessment. I know none of you really wanted to say, well, there's good assessors and bad assessors, but I think we all know there's always people you can count on and that they end up forming a certain group. So I think that might just be something else to think about. It's not just the action or the quality of the rating itself, but just how do we keep this sustained over time and, and um, yeah, not burn out our Thank you very much for, for sharing and being vulnerable. Thank you so much uh, for that very interesting uh, um, panel. Even if there was less uh, controversy and conflict and, and provocation than maybe some of us were hoping for, sometimes it was really good. I um, really appreciate that. I think that we have a, a few other thank yous in order. So, um, Sarah, I think you gave us a, a really great note to lead off on uh, in recognizing that. As we are engaged in the work of health professional education, we need to acknowledge the health professionals that are, that are doing this education work uh, on the front lines every single day, whether that's in the clinic or in the hospital or in their offices. And the really difficult times that these health professionals have had over the last couple of years, and the unwavering commitment to education and to learners and to support and to mentoring the next generation of health professionals uh, that, they, that they have engaged in. Um, I think that sometimes that work can feel meaningful and can be a real connection to the vocation of, of being a healer and being a clinician and, and being an educator, but sometimes it also probably feels like a drag. So I, I think that we owe a big thank you to, uh, to the folks who are engaged in, in that work. I'd also like to thank uh, Education Services, which funds this day and, and provides us with the funding to bring in speakers from other universities and uh, to, to put on the whole thing. And um, to particularly to Samantha Applewhite, who is uh, really the energy and, and the brains and, and uh, just makes this whole thing work. And to Courtney Wright and Shaya Novin and to Mohammed Tan Nasser, who are right there with her putting this whole thing uh, on. And, and uh, really, I have just been so impressed with the four of you, the way that you worked as a team, the way that you anticipate issues and solve them before they even come. And the way that when unexpected things come up, you are jumping in a new group to go downtown and to, and to solve problems. So thank you all, all for you so much. Uh, and thank you to our presenters and to our attendees and to everyone who came out today to, uh, to learn and, and to think and to engage in education research. This day started um, as a, a small sort of internal HSEG thing, as a component of residency week, and has just continued to grow and to grow and to grow each year, which I think is real testament to the important education work that is, that is happening here at McMaster. Uh, so thank you all for being part of that. We have a couple of uh, just admin announcements. The first one is, um, unless you want a souvenir of today, you can leave your name tags at the door and, and we will reuse uh, the lanyards for next year. But I, I don't know, if you want a little memento of the wonderful day that you have today, I, I suppose you could do it. Um, and oh yes, and we really would love to hear your feedback. So on the bottom of the website, if you go to normanresearchday.ca and you scroll all the way down, there's a really simple feedback form. We'd love to hear your ideas about uh, how we can make this better and more relevant or more applicable for you uh, next year. So, so please do chime in. That's it. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much.